Hey guys, Janet here, aka Game On Assist, and today I am talking about the 24 games I beat in 2018 and giving you guys some kind of like rapid fire thoughts on all of those games. Some of them came out this year, some of them are older. It's kind of a mixed bag, so let's jump into it. Starting off, I want to let you guys know how I kept track of all these games. So I did it using this website called Groovy. I did a video talking about Groovy um, for the How to Manage Your Backlog video that I did at the start of last year. I'll have that linked in the description and have like a card or something pop up here to kind of let you guys refer back to that video if you have not checked it out. If you didn't watch that video, it is essentially a website where you can keep track of your games, um, rate your games, talk to other people about the games that you're playing and the games they're playing. It is essentially like Goodreads, but for video games. And the really cool thing about it is besides managing your backlog and what you're playing is you can also make custom shelves to fit your needs. So for example, these are my shelves that I have here. And as you can see up here, we have like all games because I wish listed a lot of games that I feel like I need to play. Um, my backlog, what I've played, what I'm playing, um, and then also games I beat per year because personally I like to think about when I beat them. And there is like a date added, date completion completed section on all the games, but I sometimes forget to like log that properly so I like having them just already in their own shelves um, so I'm going to edit this one and make it um, lowercase and then in caps I'm going to put games I beat in 2019 and log it there too um, so I'll have that also in the description as well as like how you can friend me on there if you end up using Groovy it is a free service and I just really like using it to track my games games I beat in 2018 we'll do this in order in which I beat them we have Celeste and it was great loved it Amazing platformer, challenging platformer, um, one of the best games to come out this year. It's one of the few games where, you know, it really proved that a strong, heartfelt, emotional story, which if you're not kind of familiar with what's going on with Celeste, uh, it touches on a lot of topics about uh, mental health and depression and self-care and um, struggling in life and also the, um, the purpose of taking on challenging things and doing hard things and what does it take to do hard things what does it mean to face the worst parts of your inner self what does it mean to accept um those parts of yourself it touches on all those themes and motifs in a really like eloquent way um using drawing on a lot of different like interesting metaphors that it didn't necessarily even need to draw on but it, it did so in a way that was really smart and made it feel like not super heavy-handed and obvious and in your face even though you know the topics are very clearly put out there. Um, but I love that this game showed you can have like that deep, heartfelt story, that big social statement, but you can also still have a good game. Uh, and you can have like a strong platformer that still has a good story. So, you know, I feel like so often there are games that are brilliant at platforming, you know, like Super Meat Boy. Um, and then there are games that are like great at telling story, like Severed, but a lot of times I feel like, you know, you get one or the other, but never both. And Celeste actually does give you both. And that's amazing. As far as it being a hard platformer, I know some of you might be reluctant to play it because it is hard. You can do like an easier setting, which is helpful for people, whether you play the whole game that way or part of the game. Personally, I like just keeping it regular because I love a challenging platformer. But one thing that made this really approachable is it saves per screen so you only have to get through like one little section in order to you know really have gotten through that area of the game and instead of like other platformers where there is maybe a lot of things happening very quickly on screen or you have to move fast to get through it I found it to be a lot more slow paced there are a few chase sequences and a few like maybe um, additional obstacles but there aren't like enemies pretty much in the traditional sense at all it's just environmental stuff with a few exceptions of like boss-ish sequences. I don't want to give too much away, but there's like a few moments where you are kind of maybe on the run from something specific. Um, so it's very much like you versus the level design and that's really refreshing and really nice and um, a lot more approachable than other challenging platformers. And um, yeah, it's just, it's really well done. I also love like the death animation. It's so charming that I'm like, you know what? Don't even mind that I exploded. It's just little pop and then you're back where you were. Next game I played was also very strong. I played Mario plus Rabbids Kingdom Battle. I actually have that right over here. And this is a game that it came out I think in 2017, but I didn't play it until now. Um, I don't know why I ended up actually even buying it. I was very reluctant. I hate the Rabbids. I think they look ugly. I think they're creepy looking. 
and I don't play I didn't play XCOM so I was like I don't I don't even play this genre at all this is the first time I think I played a game of this genre but I absolutely loved it I finally like fell into the hype and like literally everyone who plays this is like I didn't want to play it at first but then when I did it was really good that's me it's really good play it it's very approachable I loved all like the weapons in the game it was like really cute and just interesting and then you they let you remap re the skill tree and stuff so I found it also very approachable you have to play this game it is so damn good that's all I'm gonna say because I don't I've already taken too long talking about Celeste um but yeah really charming my favorite weapon is the um the honey one because it's cool and stopping enemies in honey is useful the next game I played was an indie game called Shoe. it was developed and published by CodeSync this is also a platformer but way easier Actually, I would say it's a pretty easy platformer. And it I just feel like the art style of it. It's very charming, soothing. Uh, there's like some collectibles if you want to maybe push yourself challenge-wise. And you're kind of collecting or gathering like your party members. And each person that you have in your party has a different ability. And whatever level you like have them in is designed to have them use whatever skill they have so maybe like one of them for instance has an umbrella where they can kind of fly upwards similar to like baby peach in um in like yoshi's island ds i think was the game so stuff like that they have like these different abilities and when they walk they hold hands together so cute the next game i played was a huge gap i had as a gamer and as a fan of adventure games the stanley parable I finally played the Stanley Parable. I had it in my Steam for forever because I got it in a Humble Bundle and I just never played it. I got it, I think, in the, um, the, like, anti... It was, like, essentially, like, an anti-Trump Humble Bundle. Like, it was called, like, the American Humble Bundle or something and it had so many good games in it. I played that. It was awesome. I played it multiple times, of course. I got a lot of the endings. Definitely not all because some of those are, like, ridiculous. But it was really fun, very charming. Um, and I can definitely see how it laid the foundation for a lot of games to come. I really got a strong sense. Like, it reminded me a lot in terms of the writing of, like, Portal and its humor. And it's coming to console next year with some new endings and stuff. So, uh, you know, I might dip back into that if it gets an update on PC because that's where I played it. And, yeah, that one was very good. Obviously, everyone knows that. Next game I played in Beat was A Way Out. I played this with my brother, Edwin. He has been on the channel several times. I will link his videos in the description. And this game was fantastic and I think is one of the most overlooked games of 2018. Mandatory co-op, but you only need one disc to be able to play it. Um, you can do it local or online. I have actually tested out the online and it works pretty well, I would say. I didn't have really any issues with it. And it has moments where it's split screen co-op and then moments where you're in the same screen. So it flips depending on what you need. Uh, one thing that really surprised me about this game was it wasn't just about um, like getting out of the prison. Like when I saw the ads for it and the promotional and the trailers, I kind of just assumed, well, we're just going to get out of the prison and once we're out, the game is over. I actually feel like the game just picks up once you get out of prison. There are a lot of fun little mini games that you can play in this. And it really like brings out your that competitive side that always underscores co-op where you kind of want to be one, not the person that's messing up. And two, if you're like me in a level and you can both collect coins, you want to be like faster or collect more coins like low key, you know, not in a really malicious way. But I think that's always underneath co-op experiences. And this really brings that out by having you do like, you know, a baseball mini game or a little rhythm game. And you can you, you, know, you can literally compete with like, you know, playing horseshoes and seeing who can like toss the horseshoe better I don't know how to play horseshoes so I didn't do well at that one but that was really magical and there's an amazing um like the the way the narrative ends up going here is really memorable I don't want to spoil anything avoid spoilers if you have not played this game but you absolutely have to play it it is awesome and I think it's actually pretty cheap and I'm sure it's like being discounted maybe it'll end up on game pass if it isn't already play this game and Joseph Ferris is awesome and you have to play this. It's great. Next game I beat was Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. This is another game I played also with Edwin. Uh, we co-op this together and it was really hard. Um, it was not as hard though as other Donkey Kong games, uh, even in the modern era, like Country Returns on the 3DS is brutal. This one was not that bad. We actually got through most of it without even buying balloons or anything because we kind of didn't want to like cheese it. But towards the end, I'm like, we need these balloons. We need like 50 balloons to be the last boss. I just could not, I could not do it. 
I just couldn't do it. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, not too much else to say about it. It's a Donkey Kong game, and Donkey Kong games are amazing. They have great level design and a lot of personality to them. Love those little, like, cart levels where you're, like, jumping around in the in the little cart going down the rails. Next game I beat was Detroit Become Human. Now, this was a memorable one for me because I've been looking forward to this game since, like, 2016, 17, like, a while. I've been tracking this game for a while. I see it at E3. I've really wanted it. And finally, it came out. And I got it. I think I got it, like, the day it came out or, like, that weekend or something very early on. And I sat down to play it. And I, whatever weekend I got it, it was a three-day weekend. I was still teaching at the time. So um, I think I had an extra day or something maybe. But I, regardless, I played it straight through. Like, I played it at, in the evening. And then I played it until, like, four in the morning to just finish it. Because I got to a certain point where I'm like, I can finish this whole thing. And even playing in one sitting, which usually binges make me dislike a game a little bit, it was so good. The Trip Become Human is my problematic fave game of the year. Why is it problematic? One, um, Quantic Dream slash David Cage. Uh, there's some some questionable practices there, some questionable artistic choices in terms of how people are depicted or represented, just in general. You can Google a lot of articles on that if you're curious to why, like, there's kind of a little bit of like drama around that um but that aside in terms of the game itself some of its takes on like social commentary are very head-ass um without giving too much away like there's you know just from the trailers you can tell this there's like you know the conflict of androids versus humans and at one point are androids so human that they just are rights things like that um this idea of like for servitude aka slavery and then the androids look like humans and it's like you just kind of automatically draw those parallels between like the slavery of the androids and the slavery of black people in the united states and that's you know tough territory to pull off and i don't think they pulled it off very well it was not good you know they threw in some mlk quotes there that you know needed to just stay off the whole thing they also had that like binary of like do you want to be a peaceful protester or do you want to be an anarchist and it was very like black and white and i know it's a choice game and you can only put so many choices it's very hard to capture the nuance of protest but they still failed to capture it and i do not you know i will still criticize that because i don't know maybe take on different subject matter if you can't do it well but that aside that's only like one of the storylines as well like there are three storylines that go on there is connor um kira and Jesse Williams, okay, whoever, I forgot the name of that character, but, um, you know, there's three different storylines, and the other ones are, I think, a lot better, like, a lot more well done, like, the Jesse Williams one didn't, you know, it kind of fell apart in some places, uh, and the ending was very bad, but I've already talked a lot about the negative, I do want to get to the positive, gorgeous looking game, the detail of the decisions and how they affect your game are really well thought out, not at all obvious. They feel genuine. Feels like your choices matter. You end up caring about the characters. It's very emotionally weighted. Um, there's a lot of tough choices to make. There's a lot of um, suspicion that you feel as a player and that you know your character feels. And it's just really, really, really well done. Um, like the story goes in so many different directions that this game has a lot of replay value. And when I was playing it, literally, there was a moment where I screamed at my TV. I've never screamed at a video game like that before from, like, a story. But I was, like, it was, like, I was shocked. I was so taken aback. I won't say what it was because spoilers. But, yeah, this game is amazing. If you like adventure games, if you like narrative games, if you like games, you need to play this game. Because it was good as hell. The next game I played was not a good game. I played Kirby Star Allies, and it sucked. Uh, Kirby Star Allies was... It was just bad. I played the demo and I was excited and I was like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. This game's going to be great. I love Kirby, good. Friends, good. Let's go. But it was not good. It definitely did play itself. It's another game I played with Edwin and beat with Edwin. The boss at the end was very like left field in terms of how it worked mechanically. And all the levels just lacked complete personality. I felt like I was in the same level over and over again, just on a loop. And it was bad. It was a boring game. I cannot recommend this game. It was not a good game. The next game I played after that was Late Shift. This is a full motion video game where you are, it's essentially like, it plays as if it's an interactive movie. And it's available on, I think, like pretty much all platforms. It's awesome. If it was a movie, it would be a really shitty movie. But as a game, it's pretty good. 
you know, I enjoyed the choices. There's a lot of different outcomes you can get. It shows you what all the outcomes, well, it shows you, like, how many outcomes you got. I think there's, like, seven or something, so it'll show you how many you've gotten in a given playthrough. You know, it's about, like, an hour, maybe, like, less, but, like, 30, 40 minutes. It's designed so that you can play through it multiple times without it being a hassle, and it's just fun. It's just fun to play with and try to figure out how to get the different endings, even though the narrative itself is cheesy, but I also feel like it's, like, a kind of like a shitty action movie in some ways and it's actually kind of charming how like cheese it is so yeah late shift if you haven't played it hidden gem very enjoyable the next game i played was another game with edwin i actually played a lot of these games with edwin maybe edwin should just be on here next time but i played unravel 2 and it was even better than unravel 1 which is a game i loved the platforming was really nice very simple so it's not like you're gonna be like crazy challenged there are a few chase sequences that will challenge you a little bit and some of the puzzles took a little while to kind of work your way through the bonus levels in this game are very challenging uh, but also very satisfying so if you're looking for something a little bit harder uh, unravel 2 does have something to offer you in terms of those bonus sections you know it won't be like the whole game uh and it was also a very emotional game it was you know it had a lot of like touching cute moments um I wouldn't say it was emotional in storytelling at all. Like, the story made even less sense than the last game, and the last game's story didn't make any sense either. But Unravel 2, if you didn't play that, you need to play it. I feel like no one noticed it because it's a sequel, and indie game sequels never... They just always fall under the radar, but it was really, really good. The next game I beat was Runbow, and this game was... It's really old. It came out in 2015, um, but it's a platformer. <laughs> I played a lot of platformers, and... Um, the general, like, shtick of this game is that you're playing and it changes, like, colors. Like, the background changes colors. So, and when, so let's say there's a platform that's, like, orange and one that's blue. If the screen goes orange, the orange platform is no longer visible or the blue one is. So it'll toggle between these different colors and different elements of the level will be visible. And it's just a fun way to, um kind of add complexity to what otherwise would have been kind of simplistic level design but also create interesting layers and allow for unique problem solving within a given level because you're kind of not just running through a level and saying how do I get from point A to point B but you're also negotiating the background and what's going on on screen all the time so it holds your attention really well it is multiplayer available and there's also like some battle type modes that were really fun as well so it has a lot going for it. It's Like I said, it's a really old game, but if you haven't picked it up yet, I think it's a, a really nice one to grab, especially if you can get it on a sale. Um, it, it was fun. Yeah, I really, really enjoyed Renbo. Next game I played was The Spectrum Retreat. And what did, how much did I, what did I rank this game as? I ranked it as mostly didn't like it on Groovy. I would say, I don't know if that's accurate. I kind of liked, I kind of liked it. I don't know. It was, um, it's not, it's not good. It's not a good game. But it has, like, a lot going for it, and the puzzles are pretty interesting. The, but the story, it's just, the, it's kind of a mess of a game. So generally the premise is that you wake up and you're in this hotel and it kind of seems like you're on this loop of a simulation. There's, like, these kind of futuristic robots in the hotel, and then you are attempting to sort of break out of the cycle or regain your memories, kind of discover what's going on. Uh, as you guys can see on screen from the just general story trailer, it gets kind of convoluted because everything's sort of spliced together in a confusing way, and it's hard to tell like what the game is based on this, but essentially you're doing puzzle solving that's super similar to what you experience in Portal, but instead of portals, you are manipulating colors to make your way through um, the various rooms from like the start of the door to the end of the door and all the levels are kind of isolated from the hub world which is basically the hotel um the next set of footage that you guys are seeing on here is from like a let's play that the developers did this is makes it a lot clearer as to how you play the game this is from the first level of the game and as you can see you have like this circle phone in your hand and you can exchange colors with these different blocks so you can click on the white block and make it orange and click on the orange block and now you have white and etc. So you can kind of swap out these colors and your goal is to make it through the doors to the end, these kind of like panel-ish hologram doors. So like when you have orange, you can't go through the white one, you need white. So you exchange that color and then go on through. Um, and you keep passing that way. Uh, on screen right now, it looks extremely simple and it, it kind of seems like, well, what's the point of doing this? 
But as the levels progress, they become increasingly complicated. So um, even in this next section, you'll notice that there's going to be several um, hologram kind of panels for you to go through where you're going to have to decide like what order you're swapping out the colors in based on what's coming next. So once again, right here, you're just passing through pretty easily. And then this is where you're going to have to think about it because there are three blocks in the room and there's several um, like hologram panels for you to travel through. So first you need orange, but then you also have to think ahead as to what you'll need to make it through all of the panels. There's not really a way to like get stuck though in the game necessarily like they make it so they can always kind of get out or you can restart the entire sequence pretty sim easily if you mess it up but as you see here you're like alternating the colors and that required you to like think ahead a little bit and as you progress through more levels uh, that kind of builds upon itself uh, one criticism I have of the game however is that it got like really complicated at the end um, and also like just narratively it didn't really fit together in the way that would make sense as to kind of why you're doing all these actions like the puzzles themselves were fine but the story bit uh, didn't really pull it together so overall I wouldn't say it's a good game because the story and the gameplay is so like clashing against each other but it's it does have some value and if you really like puzzles i think it could be an interesting thing to pick up the next game i played was also kind of mediocre it was called candleman and it is like an indie game it's a platformer as well with um it, i think it kind of positions itself as a puzzle platformer but you're not really solving puzzles you're kind of just trying to figure out how to get through the level i don't really consider that to be a puzzle every now and then you like step on a switch to open a door or something but i really didn't feel like it did much puzzle wise it's a very slow start, but when it, towards like that last third, it actually did become a good game, so it was kind of like unique. I will say since it's so easy, it can be kind of soothing and like meditative, so I think keep your eye out if you see like a sale and maybe you're looking at the footage and you like what you see and you think, you know, there'd be a good chance that you might enjoy this. I, I've also reviewed a few of these games. Uh, Candleman was one of the ones I reviewed for work, so I'll put my review in the description as well of it. Candleman, it was it was okay, basically. Next game I played was Donkey Kong Country Returns. Busted out the 3DS to play Donkey Kong Country Returns. And it's an amazing game. Hard as hell. It is such a hard platformer. I actually started, let's see if I have my 3DS stats on here. My playtime of Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D was 18 hours and 51 minutes. I launched the software four to four times. My average playtime was 25 minutes. And I first played this September 8th, 2016, and I beat it on August 25th, 2018. So that was my experience with Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D. It was a long road. Long road for Donkey Kong Country. And I just finished it mainly out of spite. Because um, it's so hard that I just, I just couldn't do it. But I finally did it, and it felt really good to be done. Very well designed, very good game, very hard game. Donkey Kong Country Returns. The next game I played was Yoko's Island Express. This is definitely one of my favorite games of the year uh, and one of my favorite games ever. It is so much fun. Uh, I played it on Nintendo Switch. I think it works great on Switch because you can just kind of do this handheld style. I played the whole game on a road trip to uh, Nashville and then Disney World, which was also very fun. But Yoko's Island Express, it was my vacation game, so I have fond memories of it. But also, it's just really unique, but also extremely approachable. So it's a pinball platformer metroidvania which sounds ridiculous but essentially you are a little beetle and you're on an island you end up becoming the postman and your job is to at first just deliver the letters you know kind of as a postman but you realize very early on that the island is in trouble and needs help so you're looking to kind of restore things in the island to as they were and everything's just really cutely drawn i love cute games cute games are my favorite thing and I was really satisfied to see that even though it was kind of like you have that pinball mechanic of instead of jumping you'll like roll and then there'll be a, a like a bump I don't think it's called a bumper but you know the little like thing that you flick you have to like flick yourself to the next area but instead of like it wasn't really that challenging though like you didn't have to be good at pinball like I'm not good at pinball and like eyeing stuff but it's 
it's fairly approachable in how you have to do it and a lot of that stuff will be kind of automated it's i think you can technically die but it'd be kind of hard to you'd have to get hurt like a lot of times um and not like collect anything so yeah i mean there is a good amount of that backtracking because it's a metroidvania uh but a couple things i really liked about it besides the aesthetic and the mechanic is the fact that later you do get sort of a form of of fast travel through the beehive that you kind of open up these gates and can shoot across the world and the other thing is unlike other metroidvanias a lot of times you know especially if you think really old school it's like that place is too high I probably need to get the double jump ability. Oh, I have the double jump ability. Guess I'll go back to... It doesn't really feel that way at all. I mean, there's maybe some mechanics you could guess, but they're very... Like, the powers you get are kind of unique. So you don't really realize that, like, oh, like, this is going to help me do this other thing. And I didn't even know that I needed this ability. But now that I have it, now I do have that, like, light bulb moment of I know where I need to go back to or where I can reach next. And there's a little bit of a, a plot twist in the game, too. So it has a lot going for it very underrated game as well one of my favorite games of the year so i actually had to jump back in to say that i also beat bleed this is another game i co-opted with edwin it's basically an action platformer game kind of running gun style there's an onslaught of enemies that are constantly attacking you on screen you have a couple different weapons that you get to choose from um, throughout the game like i said you can co-op it uh we co-opted together on easy mode because it was actually pretty challenging after a while um so we beat the game on easy, went back and started replaying a little bit of it on normal, uh, which at that point it felt like a lot more manageable. One thing I like about this game is that in addition to just controlling your character and jumping around, you're also controlling the way you aim your gun with the other analog stick. And it, the controls just felt really smooth and I really liked the design of it. It's very arcadey, both in the gameplay and its presentation. So I think this is a really good one to pick up if you haven't played it already. Next game I played was the game I played on my phone. This is the year I got into mobile gaming. So next game I played was Donut County and that's available on mobile and uh, PS4. It's also coming to Switch and I think Xbox One as well. So you can play it on console if you want to, but to be honest, I think it works best on the phone and it's the cheapest on the phone because you have that small screen, it's easier to manipulate the little circle. Uh, a lot of people describe this game as being like the inverse of Katamari Damacy. So instead of like rolling and getting bigger and bigger, you are a hole and you're moving it around and then you're sucking up everything and the hole is getting bigger but everything else is disappearing. That's essentially the mechanic of the game. There are um, some variations on that. Uh, I did a little mini Twitter review that I'll, I'll link for you guys on it going a little bit more in depth. The writing of the game is really good and it's really satisfying to clear the entire space. Um, and there's actually a really nice story um, attached to it. Well, I wouldn't say it's nice in terms of like feeling like, ooh, a warm fuzzy is nice, but uh, it kind of does look a lot of ways at gentrification. And when I heard that analysis before I played the game, I was like, you guys are reaching, like, it's not really about gentrification, but once you really get towards the end of the story, you're like, this is totally about gentrification. And that's really cool. Um, you don't really need to do anything with that. I just feel like the story was well written. Outside of the larger themes, I really loved the humor of the game. It was very, very charming. That's all I have to say. Donut County, it was great. I played it in a day. You can do it easily in like one or two sittings or a couple sittings if you want to break it up. I went to a donut shop, I bought a donut, and I played Donut County, and it was an amazing Saturday afternoon. The next game I beat was Flipping Death, uh, developed by Zoink Games. This game, it didn't really do it for me. I did give it a review on my channel. I believe I gave it a 6 or a 6.5 on my channel, which, remember guys, when I do my reviews, which I've only done the one formally, um, I don't do 7s, I just take it off the scale, so the scale's 1 to 6 or 8 to 10. Um, and yeah, it, I just couldn't really say that it was like, you know, that next level. Um, but even with the seven, like it's just, it's not good because the mechanics just are a little bit too wonky. I know it's kind of supposed to be like, oh, the physics is weird. That's part of what makes it fun. But no, because it's not really like, it's not a game like Octodad. Like it's just a game where you're exploring and you get to like control um, people's bodies to like puzzle solved within like two different dimensions like the living the world living and the dead so when you're in the world of the living you're possessing someone and when you're in the world of the dead you're just yourself this penny and your goal is to kind of figure out like why you died and maybe try to get back um you see your antagonist early on in the story and you're kind of chasing that person and trying to see like what their deal is essentially and and how you can restore things to how they should be that's generally what the goal the goal of the game is and along the way there's some like environmental puzzles but I found them to be like just kind of obtuse 
I don't think they were really well done and I they did give you in-game tips but I kind of felt honestly like I needed to use the tips all the time and at that point I'm like why don't you just tell me what I need to do at this point I feel like I'm just reading these vague instructions so that's just kind of a quick thing on why I wasn't that into it the writing can be could be good so, sometimes it was corny but a lot of the writing was actually quite funny and the art style was gorgeous and, and the music was great too so the presentation of the game was amazing but the gameplay it wasn't that good to me. Uh, you guys can check out that full review on this channel uh, directly, actually. Next game I beat was Marvel Spider-Man. Uh, Marvel Spider-Man was awesome. It's very basic, but it's very enjoyable. And by basic, I mean it just, you know, it doesn't really, um, it's weird. It's like the best, just all right experience I've ever had. Like swinging does actually feel amazing. I will give them that. Like everyone said, oh, the swinging, you gotta swing. You swing and it feels so good. And I'm like, whatever. And then I did it and it was awesome. That totally lives up to the hype. That is true. Um, but the problem with Marvel Spider-Man is after a while, it's essentially like a beat em up. Like, you know, after a while, but like a 3D, <laughs> like after a while, you kind of just face the same enemies over and over again. You're doing the same thing. Um, one thing that was really unique about Marvel Spider-Man, however, was the fact that the boss battles were actually some of the best parts of the game. They weren't hard to do, but they were very cinematic, very grandiose. Uh, they felt like they actually meant something. And I thought they like really tied the game together well narratively and mechanically at the same time and usually when I have to face a boss I'm just annoyed because you know usually when I play a boss I have to fight them over and over again or you know it's just the same like pattern and you're just waiting for the health bar to go down and you're just like I just want to go back to the rest of the game because the boss always feels so isolated here it was really well incorporated into um what I would kind of describe as like an in like a diorama style open world like you can explore New York City but it's not like you can go inside all the buildings and stuff and you know you can only go so far in the world until you kind of hit the end of the game but they did that really well and I really actually did enjoy like the menial tasks like I know a lot of people wouldn't maybe be interested in getting the backpacks or whatever but like even though they didn't really were like doing the little like science missions but I love that stuff in Spider-Man specifically I think it being smaller really worked to its benefit because I felt more enticed to like get my fun from what the game already created rather than just aimlessly wandering around the city overall Marvel Spider-Man basic but an absolute must play because it's really really fun and this is one of the best Spider-Man stories I've experienced now I don't read the comics at all and I, I know I didn't watch like the most recent movies and people are like, oh, the really recent ones are cool. And I'm sure Into the Spider-Verse is fine and stuff. But like, I've just never, <sighs> Spider-Man's always just been so cheesy in all the times I've experienced the narrative of Spider-Man. And there's still like a lot of the stupid cheesy jokes in this one, but I really enjoyed watching like his relationship with all his characters play out. Um, and it was cool to see it, like, obviously draw on existing Spider-Man lore, but also kind of become a story in its own right uh, and be really approachable to um, even audiences that might not be, like, super well-versed in who all these enemies are from prior um, knowledge. And the suits were awesome. I did a video on the suits ranked in hotness, and that was quite fun to do. The next game I beat was Transference, and I played this game on PSVR, but it is not a VR exclusive game. You can play it uh, without the VR headset on a couple different platforms. This game's like a sleeper hit, low-key, especially if you're looking for a game to play in VR, um, because we know that the VR library is pretty small, and even for games that are VR compatible, that list is not long, and a lot of VR experiences are shooters. Mainly shooters, like a lot. There's a lot of shooters on on VR, so sometimes it's just nice to find something different. And Transference is essentially a game where it's an adventure game. You are trying to figure out what's going on, essentially. Like you just kind of. That's one of my criticisms of it. Actually, it's not like super clear, like what the goal here is. But you essentially are dropped are you just are dropped into a world. You appear in a world, and it kind of generates in front of you. Um, you enter into the building and you're kind of trying to work your way through what has happened here, maybe how you can get out or set things right or something like that. Um, but you spend a lot of time jumping between these different, um, you can think of them as timelines or states of consciousness or perspectives. So like you get to like flip switches and like toggle between almost different realities um, while like doing puzzle solving. And it's not a horror game at all, but some moments are scary and the whole thing feels creepy as hell. So I didn't, even though I'm a huge chicken, I did enjoy like the suspense of transference and the, um, the puzzle solving was really fun. It was pretty simple, I think. 
but I, I really enjoyed it and having to explore the house over and over again. It's a pretty small area that you have to explore, the apartment rather, um, but I think the fact that they have you be able to toggle between like this is what the kid sees, this is what the mom sees, this is what the dad sees, and see like their perspective um, of the environment and kind of just travel through and kind of grab things from one reality or timeline or whatever you want to call it and bring them into another I thought was really really fun and interesting um and they also had like a lot of like nice ways to enhance the narrative through like additional tapes you can come across as collectible items through like little notes left around um I love when these kind of like walking simulator games I guess this might be more accurate than adventure when they have these they encourage you to explore the world by making the world interesting to explore. So like, you know, the notes on the fridge, like this, the kind of magazine that's sitting on the coffee table, like that's the kind of stuff that I get into and like to look at. And, uh, and this game had that. So, you know, I think it was, it probably has some room to grow, I would say, you know, it wasn't amazing, but I think it's a good game, especially if you're looking for a VR experience that, um, you know, it just is quality and different than what else is available to do in VR. And I think it was especially creepy in VR because it's kind of about, like, other realities. So it was, like, super, like, on the nose in terms of that. The next game I beat was Creed Rise to Glory. And it is a VR boxing game. I played it on PSVR. And it's a really, really good workout. But it is just kind of a mediocre game. My issue with Creed Rise to Glory is it kind of sells itself as like you can be Michael B. Jordan, which is uh, what is Michael B. Jordan's character's name in Creed Rise to Glory, in Creed in general. Whatever, you know, you can be in the movie essentially is what it's positioning itself as, but you don't get any of like the nice narrative pieces. You're either always in the gym or you're always in the boxing ring fighting an opponent. There's not really any in between, so you don't really get any narrative minus literally one scene um so i would have liked them to add more of the story i feel like you know this game accomplishes what it feels like to box well uh, which is impressive but it doesn't actually like encompass what a creed movie or rocky movie is it doesn't have any like and you know rocky's there and training you and you would think that there'd be like some inspirational quotes or amazing monologues or just you know something to make you feel like you're really there and it doesn't have um have any of that which is uh kind of unfortunate and really lacking so that that's my experience of Creed Rise to Glory I would say if you're looking for a cool boxing sim uh and like a little workout game awesome pickup if you're looking to like feel like you're in Creed the movie mm, this isn't really going to do that for you the next game I played was Minute I'm going to try to have this discussion on Minute in one minute so let's see it is a game where you are spawned in you have one minute before you die and you're trying to get through the game that way and so you have to keep just dying over and over again but each life you have you essentially are trying to accomplish one task it's essentially a puzzle game it's more like it's not really like a puzzle puzzle you're trying to like be get a resource that you need like you can tell okay here like the puzzle is more figuring out what you need to do next it's like oh I need to pick up some water so I probably need like a bucket to get the water it's that kind of thing it's black and white it looks kind of um, like really minimalistic and I think it's easy to gloss over it if you just see the gameplay but it's really fun and a really unique experience and I played that on switch and it was awesome that's minute and I think I did that in under one minute so there you go Kirby Planet Robot was the next game I beat and this game was good I'm like, this really reminded me that Kirby Star Allies was not good because this is what a good Kirby game looks like. It has all the makings of a good Kirby game. The level design is charming and unique, stands out. And they gave Kirby, like, a shtick. I feel like each Kirby game, um, especially like, the modern ones, because the older ones are kind of figuring out what what's up with Kirby, they take a certain approach. So, oh, it's the aesthetic. It's, you know, the fact that he's made of yarn. It's the fact that he can... You know, the world is all like rainbow, pastel, painting-like. In this one, it was the mech. And Kirby being in a mech was all I ever wanted from Kirby. It made the power-ups really, really fun. And it was just great to like run through those levels using all those power-ups. So yeah, it was just a blast to play Kirby Planet Robot. That was another game that I dusted off the 3DS to play. Um, and actually got that game through Gamefly, which I will be reviewing on my channel uh, this year. My thoughts on having the Gamefly subscription and how that went. Uh, so you guys will hear about that in a little bit. Next game I beat was another mobile game. It was Florence. This game is one that you can play easily in one sitting. Uh, it's kind of designed actually to be in one sitting. So you just kind of 
work your way through it. It's very, very beautiful. And it's essentially about um, a young woman and she's developing this relationship with this guy and it goes through their relationship. There's no voice acting or anything like that or even direct dialogue at all. It's all told through like sound and the imagery that you see on screen. It's also like really amazing the way they like utilize the fact that it's a mobile game. They have you do like certain actions directly and it makes you feel really immersed in the experience. So like she might be at her desk drawing and then she's going to color something. You get to choose the colors. She might be brushing her teeth and you have to move your finger back and forth on the screen. Like it just really does pull you into the experience in a way that feels like, okay, this, like to me, like what is a good mobile game? Because a lot of people talk about like there's so many like, oh, you just, you know, pay to win or like slot machine-esque games. And a lot of those exist and actually, you know, they can be fun. They have their place. But to me, a really good mobile experience is one that takes advantage of the platform. It knows the mobile game and it uses that to its advantage to give you something that you can't get on console and you can't get on PC. I think Florence really uh, succeeded at that in in a way that's really impressive and has stuck with me um, throughout the remainder of the year. And that one's also developed by Anna Perna Interactive, or sorry, published by Anna Perna Interactive, not developed, uh, which also published Donut County. So basically, Anna Perna, like, watched that publisher because so many of their games are really good. So like, for 2019, and you know, it's probably like a cold take, but like, I just kind of realized like all these games come from that publisher like always look for like who publishes or who develops the games that you're like digging because you'll find those trends and then I'm like I'm just gonna follow you into the sun whatever you make whatever you're putting out there like let me download that because it's gonna be good next game I played and the last game I beat in 2018 um because I wasn't able to finish some games that I was playing like I didn't finish God of War guys oops (laughs) the last game I beat in 2018 I think was Broken Age this game was pretty special to me to be able to finally beat because this is a game I started playing when I was in college. Um, so it was like 2015, 2016. So it's been at least like, you know, two years, probably three or four years since I like last played this game. And I stopped playing this game because I got stuck and I didn't want to be bothered to figure it out. And I think even with the guide, I was kind of having some pro- some problems and I still had a while of the game to go. So I, I stepped away from it and I never came back until this year because it was, it's been bothering me. There's a few games that I'm really close to finishing and it just eats at me a little bit. So this was one of those games. But my own relationship with the game aside, it is an adventure game where you get to um, play two stories simultaneously. Eventually they do have some... Lo- like there's a reason these two stories are put together like, you know, thematically or like in terms of the collective story that's being told which becomes clearer as you play it so I'm not going to go into like why are you know why is Shay and what's the girl's name I think it starts with a V but whatever like why are these two characters like positioned in the, in the one game that becomes clearer later but it's like point and click adventure so you just kind of go and you puzzle solve and you combine objects to accomplish like different tasks that need to be done they're of varying complexity I will say they're are times especially depending on how like good or not good you are these games for me the whole idea of like combining items and using things creatively is hard for me I don't really play a lot of games that are like that so I did hit a couple walls uh but honestly just have like a guide kind of ready to go um I think it's still worth playing and it's a fun game to figure out because some of the solutions are really unique the writing's pretty good and more importantly like where the overall plot is going is interesting because it's constantly changing and it takes like you really don't really get the full picture of what all of this was and how it all comes together until you play through the entire game. So it's very captivating in like what's going on on the macro and in the micro and the gameplay. It's just like it's it's fun, it's charming, and the art style is really nice. So that's it. I beat at least then 24 games in 2018. I accomplished my goal of beating more games than I beat in 2017, which in 2017 I had beaten 18 games. So I beat that goal by quite a lot. And my goal this year is to beat at least 25 games. So I can, each year I want to beat more games than I did last year until I hit a breaking point. <laughs> and we're going to see what that breaking point is uh, over the next couple of years. So I'm excited to do that. Um, but let me know in the comments below, guys, what games did you beat this year? Of those games that you beat, which was your favorite? Of the games that I beat, like actually finished, because I didn't finish God of War, so I had to pick a different game. Oh, God. Uh, I shouldn't have done this to myself. I think... I think my favorite was probably Detroit Become Human. 
Um, but honorable mentions on that. Um, oh, maybe Celeste. This is a hard question. I guess Celeste is probably the best game that I beat uh, this year. But my favorite game was probably Detroit Become Human. And honorable mention is Yoko's on Express because it's so cute and really unique. So, yeah, let me know what games you guys were digging in 2018, which ones you beat, what your goals are going into the next year gaming-wise. Um, I don't make a whole lot of gaming goals, but one of them always is to beat more games than last year. Um, thanks for checking this out. Be sure to hit thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe to the channel, tap the bell, and I will see you guys here next time. Bye.